right, it does say live on Facebook. Okay, I live on Facebook. Live. Hello, Friday afternoon, July 31st, 2020. It's been a hot week. Really warm, really, really warm. <laughs> and here we are on Friday, having made a lot of adjustments. Temperature's gone down five degrees, approximately, and we have been working very hard <laughs> to figure out where to go from here. And we have, we have a lot of information for you today. I know you probably have a lot of questions and we are eager to hear what your questions are, to see how well our information is getting out and to see how you're making it along uh, with us in this turbulent time. I remember. So yeah. After last Friday's fireside chat, I was like, oh, Next week, this week, should be a pretty calm, yeah. quiet week. We were going to sail. Much. We were just going to sail this week. <laughs> but that but did not end up being the case. No, it's been an interesting week. So I am going to actually just go directly to Dr. Hoff and let him. Do you want to talk about the, the metrics and the changes that were announced, or do you want me to talk about that? I can do that. Yeah, I'll do it. say why we're having to change things a little bit? All right, so I guess that was actually... Tuesday, we got information from the Oregon Department of Ed and Dr. Seidlinger, the governor's um, medical advisor. And we also, we got a little feedback. Oh, and, and also uh, direction from the governor. And it changed some things in Crook County School District. That actually changed some things across Crook County. So there is now a set of metrics established whereby we must guide our opening or reopening of school. And so we are looking to hit fewer, uh, 10 or fewer cases per 100,000 and an active rate of less than 5% for the total population for three weeks in a row. And <clears throat> there can be no active outbreaks throughout the district and then as of Friday, July the 31st, Crook County had 28.7 cases per 100,000 and an active case rate of 2.8. But there is an exception for younger students. And the reason there's an exception is that younger students experience more impact when they're not receiving face-to-face -face instruction from their teacher. So the exception is that when you hit 30 per 100,000 and less than 5% of the total population with an act and no active outbreak, then you can bring your K through three students back. So we've adjusted our plan. We have set some target dates and we are monitoring the matrix very carefully so that we can tell if it's safe to bring our students back, our K through three students first. And we believe that right now, according to the metrics, that we can bring our K through three students back. So um, we've, I say that Joel has created and recreated um, charts and we're going to present that information to you. So I'm turning it over to Dr. Hoff to present some um, graphics that will explain the plans. Yeah, so you know, as, as we left here last week, we had planned to be able to open schools K through 12. Um, with the new state guidance, uh, those weekly metrics don't allow us to open uh, all schools, or sorry, all grade levels uh, right now. So the question obviously becomes, what are parents' options at this point with the new state guidance that came out on Tuesday? So what I'll share here real quick is our, uh, our new options that parents will have. And uh, as you know, Things change. So we're sitting here July 31st. Uh, we have uh, a number of weeks till school starts. So this may change, but this is currently just to give our uh, families, our teachers, and our staff an idea of what, what things are looking like. So, so we'll break it down elementary, middle, and high school. So for our elementary schools, there's essentially three main options. The first one, uh, regular instruction. So this would be what most people would, would consider a, a regular plan where, so if schools are closed, um, students are assigned a teacher with classmates. Um, teachers provide daily.
instruction and supports and students have hands on projects assignments as well as some online work. We've been watching very carefully and listening to parents based on what their experience was like last spring when we had to go to a distance learning model. So we're really going to alter what that option that. looks like uh, so that we can match what, what parents need and get feedback. For example, elementary, uh, a lot of our families said, hey, it was a little too much screen time for my young kid. So we're already looking at paper packets and options like that. So next up, when schools open and you have the regular instruction, students will then just return to the building with face-to-face uh, -face with that teacher that they've been with uh, and their classmates. Like Dr. Johnson was mentioning, based on state requirements, K-3, kindergarten through third grade, may be able to return in-person instruction before grades four through 12. So for parents that when schools are able to be open and we're able to send students back, but they say, ah, I wanna keep my kid at home, they can continue to do that. So when schools are allowed to reopen, if the family doesn't wanna send their child to school, um, they may remain in their distance learning option um, with, with a teacher that is, is planned for that. And then finally, one thing we've, we've previewed and we're excited uh, to provide more and more details today is about our homeschool partner program. So this is for parents that say, um, I, you know, I want to kind of take this on as my own, uh, but I, I don't want to homeschool all by myself. I need some resources, some support. We're launching our homeschool partner program, and that'll be the same whether we're allowed to bring students back or not, whether schools are open or closed. Um, parents will work with the homeschool coordinator, Johnny Olkers, to choose from a menu of curriculum options. Uh, parents will assist and teach their, their child through that curriculum with on-call support from our staff. We'll have weekly group tutoring sessions and individual teacher tutoring sessions available, as well as additional support, uh, support like meal service, technology, um, IEP testing services, all of that would be part of that model. So with that, let's move over to our elementary, or sorry, from our elementary to our middle school. Someone's letting us know the slides are fuzzy. The slides are fuzzy. Okay, we, uh, we are attaching this to a parent uh, email that's going out, I believe. It's also on our website. So, so it'll be on the website. So if it's a little fuzzy and you can't read uh, because it's fuzzy, know that it'll be on our website here in a few minutes. It is small print. It it's is got a lot of detail in it. Mm -hmm. I had to put a lot of words on, uh, on this. So moving to middle school. So in middle school, there is a regular instruction model. So that is, it looks different whether schools are open or closed. So when schools are closed, students will have a consistent daily schedule with four classes per quarter. Uh, teachers will provide daily virtual instruction and support and students will complete assignments and projects both digitally and hands-on. Is this middle school? This is middle school. Because we have a parent asking um, if, if students could have paper packets and some paper, more paper things at middle school as well. Yep. Yeah, definitely. We, 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 uh, like I said earlier, we're really wanting to listen to parents and what worked well with distance learning last spring and what didn't. And that's a constant feedback was parents want to see a little more hands on a little less just screen time. I think it's important for parents to know we've been doing research and finding resources that are more hands on um, kind of looking at some of the old fashioned workbooks, so to speak, workbooks and activities that are tied together yeah. so that parents have more options when the student's actually at home Certainly. and that kid isn't always on the screen. Yeah. Great feedback. Yeah. And, and again, um, parents that have continued to have feedback, let us know. We, we, uh, we work from, from what you tell us and try to make things the best we can. So if you have any feedback, continue to let us know so we can make adjustments. So for under the regular instruction model, when Schools are closed, that's what it looks like. When schools are open, those students will just return, uh, seem, have a seamless transition into the building and continue with their four classes with their teacher and with their classmates. So the next option for, for families is our CCSD online option. And this is where students take a full load of self-paced online courses that have been assigned by the online coordinator with additional support available. And this also leads us to our hybrid option, where some students, I've talked to some parents that they say, hey, I really want my student to have a live virtual or in-person teacher for math, 
but then I, I want them home for maybe an art class, a history class, an elective. This is where students can have and families can choose somewhat of a hybrid class schedule model. Uh, there's an example of that schedule where, you know, a first or second period, uh, the regular instruction model, and then they're at home for their other classes. Just a few caveats so you know what that is. When schools are permitted to reopen, students will need to return to the in-person instruction for the classes that are under the regular instruction mode. So parents that say, well, I don't want my kid to come back. So that's when you would choose the CCSD full online option for that homeschool partner program because our bus routes will be run in the morning and after school. And then also, I think it's important to say that's what our parents said they wanted. The half days weren't necessarily a model that worked for parents because of challenges. So in, and we had to limit things a little bit. That was one that we eliminated. Yep. And again, so our homeschool partner program, and you've got a bonus surprise. Johnny Oakers is here and we'll give more details as soon as I'm done here. Uh, that is open K-8. So uh, for those middle school parents that want to take partner, uh, partner class in, in a homeschool experience, uh, that'll be an option for parents as well. Let's hey. move over to high school. Yes. Hey, by the way, parents, if you're on right now, we do have a surprise coming up. Well, I guess it's not really a surprise. I just we, gave away the surprise. I know, but I just wanted to like reiterate that we have Johnny Olker here today, who is the coordinator of the homeschool support programs. So we're excited to have him on. And All right, let's jump over to high school. It looks fairly similar to our middle option. Learn option. We're not uh, available in open schools because they don't meet the weekly metrics. You have their daily classes, uh, four classes per quarter. Teachers will provide daily virtual instruction. And that's another uh, improvement that we're, we're looking to implement based off feedback where Parents are really asking for an interaction, direct instruction from teachers every day, not, you know, send out something on Monday and you work all week. So that's that's an improvement based on parent feedback. Just like the middle school, when schools, when we're able to reopen, students will just seamlessly transition back into the classroom with the classes that they're taking. Again, we have that CCSD online option, and that remains the same whether schools are open or closed. It's a full-time uh, online option with an online coordinator assigning classes. Jason, we have somebody saying it's kind of cutting in and out. Okay. Jason's on it, everybody. And uh, again, just like the middle school, there's some uh, a hybrid option where students are taking some of those courses uh, and then also some of our regular instruction courses. Same example schedule. Um, same kind of caveats around what parents should choose if they don't plan on sending their kids back to school even when they're reopening. I have a question that's come up about students on IEPs, and as soon as you get through that, I'm going to answer that question. I'm going to remind you. To answer I'll, that. I'll remember it, <laughs> Dr. Hoff. Uh, all right, and, and finally, uh, for our pioneer students, um, when students are, when schools are closed or are unable to bring students into the building, They'll have their daily course load. Uh, they'll be working with pioneer teachers. And again, they'll switch over to the um, No sound. Oh, Lindsay just no gave audio. us a thumbs up. Yeah, you got some? 
audio? All right, that worked, Janelle Dean says. So I think we're back. Going. Okay, so I think I'll go back to the, uh, to the IEP student. Yep. So the, the guidelines have established a set of expectations that, or I'm sorry, exceptions that we can exercise. And one of those ex exceptions is for students who have special needs, whether they're on an IEP or they have some other kind of special need, we can bring a student in for a limited amount of instruction with that exception in the guidelines. And um, when they're on the campus, they'll wear the face covering, but they can receive face-to-face -face instruction. So if a student who can't make progress without one-on-one uh, -on -one with their teacher or that small group instruction. So we know that that is a piece that um, we can use as we move into after, as we open the school in September. Somebody said, so is school opening in September? Well, we think right now, based upon all of the metrics that we are looking at, that Crook County, Crook County little ones, the K through three, and those who are under an exception like an IEP student based on the case manager's work, those students will be coming back starting the first week of school. The others, we've set up that um, comprehensive and, and expanded um, support and in online instruction, and then we'll keep monitoring, we'll check Every time we get more data, we'll check. And once we hit the target, we will then transition back into school. You'll get a letter today from the district that gives you the dates where the district will be reviewing the data that comes in. And then we will let parents know, and then we'll prepare to open if we qualify. All right. I think with that, let me, so let's have this. Parents, start to think of your questions. We're going to bring Johnny in to provide yeah, some more details right. about the homeschool, and then we'll come back. I'll come back and answer uh, questions. That okay, have. so let's introduce Johnny formally. Johnny, if you want to come in. So this is Johnny Olkers, and he has taught high school science for how many years, Johnny, here in Crook County? Seven years here. Seven years here, and I think you taught somewhere before. Yep, uh, another seven uh, outside of Salem. So before I came to Crook County, I was in Klamath County, and um, Johnny grew up at and went to school at Henley High, so I felt like we had a connection when he first came, and um, I talked with him last year about some of his passions and dreams for the future, and little did we know that he would get to move towards that goal sooner rather than later. So we're super thrilled that you have taken up the challenge and, and just has done some amazing work already. So Johnny, turn it over to you. All right, so uh, I've been hired to coordinate a uh, homeschool partner program for the district. And uh, I've, my wife and I have been homeschooling our kids um, and at times having our kids in, in, enrolled in the district as well, but I've worked as a public school teacher. So I have kind of an interesting perspective coming into this, having done homeschooling for a long time. And uh, so we're excited to offer a program to people in Kirk County that uh, is going to give a number of uh, benefits uh, if you're interested in homeschooling your own children. So uh, we're going to have $1,000 of instructional funds per kid that you can use to pick what curriculum um, you, you educate your child with. We're, we're uh, going to have a location at Barnes Butte Elementary. Long term, we see this program uh, existing. This isn't just uh, because of COVID, but COVID has sort of accelerated the process for us. And so we're going to have a location at Barnes Butte Elementary. Uh, we're calling it the Homeschool Hub. And uh, there will be drop-in tutoring services available. We'll have workshops. My background's teaching science, so I'm going to be teaching some uh, science workshops every week. And uh, as we bring on more teachers, we'll hopefully be offering art and PE and other things. And uh, we'll have uh, a meeting every week or every other week, depending on the family's needs, in addition to just drop-in drop tutoring services that are available. So, so really this homeschool partner program is connecting families who want to homeschool their kids with funding and with support for how to do it um, well. And, and we really see uh, education changing. And, and so in one way that that's going to be happening is education becomes more personalized for every kid. And so parents are able to see what the best options are for their own children 
and then parents are able to daily come alongside their kids and help them um, become educated in the things that matter to them and the things that interest them. And uh, also parents are able to meet the needs of their child every day. Uh, so we're really excited about this partnership. We're really excited about this opportunity to provide homeschool families with uh, resources um, in the district. Very cool. Yeah. Um, so Johnny has some ideas and as, as he's developing the program and as he's building it, we will be offering all kinds of exciting opportunities. He says he likes to do science experiments and he likes to blow things up. Yes. And uh, he wants to make sure that kids get to blow things up. Yes. Uh, you know, in a good way. In a safe way. Yes. Safety first. Yes. So. Yeah, and, um, field, and field trips and uh, just, you know, really the homeschool community can be isolated. And so it'll be a, it'll be a community uh, opportunity for homeschool families. It provides so much parent choice. Yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be, cool. a, I think it's going to be a really good option for kids. Um, just We've had a lot of people interested. So we know that we may need to hire more staff to support Johnny. We're actually, we know we'll need to hire some um, clerical help, some secretarial help. So we're going to make it a really a robust and um, growing and thriving program. So we're excited. I'm very grateful to have Johnny on board. Yeah. All right. Anything else you want to say? Um, nope. Just... Contact me if you have more questions about the program. I'm happy to talk about it. Um, we're putting my phone number and my email out. So uh, if you're at all interested and you're wondering like, hey, is this right for our family? Just give me a call and I'll talk it over with you. Awesome. Okay, so we hope to have you back again because okay. I know it's, it's um, being built and it's looking really good. So thank yeah. you for being here today and we invite you back soon. All right, thanks all right. for having me. Take care, Johnny. See you. Dr. Hoff. If we can get Johnny out of that chair, we can squeeze. we can bring you back. <laughs> I'm back. Thanks, Johnny. Yeah. All right. I think I think we're ready for some questions. I'm ready for questions. Any question that we can't answer, we of course are recording that, and um, Jason continually monitors all of the communication coming in and makes sure that parents get a response back. So. Just stick with it, and we'll get the answer to you at some point. So let's let's take a take a um, run at it. Okay. Uh, one on Facebook: Is there anything in place for parents who have to work and now be a teacher? That's a great question. It is. Um, that's what that is. Uh, so we've got what four week, five weeks until this potentially kicks off, and that's one of our top priorities: is to work and collaborate with community partners to make sure that we have all the childcare options that are available to our families spelled out. So that's something we're working on um, as a top priority because we've heard this from a ton of family and, and in all reality, our heart breaks for these families that I've, I've talked to a number of them that say, Phil, I work, I, what am I supposed to do? And that's why we're really looking at, at what childcare uh, options are available and making sure everyone knows what's available. So that'll be coming out. Stay tuned. We, that is definitely on our radar and something we're going to make sure parents uh, know what's available to them. Uh, for brothers in Helena, will be the same as in-town schools. So remember I was speaking of exceptions and small rural schools are an exception. So we're looking at brothers in Helena and figuring out what the guidelines are for them. We have the principal here, and Jim, um, what do you know at this time? Regarding rural schools? Rural schools. Yeah, we are, we're looking into what our details and our um, availability for attendance is right now, and, and I'm hoping we can find out next week. Okay, so we'll get more to you on that, um, doing some research on that, and um, we'll, we'll get back to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I think there's sort of, question confusion around the, the three week data issue. Like you do have to wait so long before you make a decision. Mm -hmm. So you might want to clarify that we have to have three weeks of good data. You have to meet, so for grades four through 12, you have to have under 10 cases per 100,000 with a certain test positivity rate for three weeks in a row. Uh, so that's what we'll be reviewing and measuring. So you need to have three weeks in a row before you can open. So you're really looking at a trend of case levels. So yes. Okay. Um, 
So yeah. will IEP students be on staggered days or will they go every day? So the case manager will work with the parent to set up the plan for the IEP students. It depends on student need. And that's in the guidelines is that you look at the student's need and you see how you need to academically and socially, emotionally, you need to support them and then you build the plan to serve them and they can come to school and get that instruction. And they'd be coming for specific services. Specific instruction and services and then back, back home. So it's not as if they're going to be there all day, they will come there for instruction. Okay, so do we know for sure about K through three on August 15th? Like that's one of the dates we're looking at. Whenever someone asks, do we know for sure? <laughs> it's tricky. Uh, and the so, first day of school is actually September 8th. Mm -hmm. So that would be the day, should everything go the right direction, that K3 would begin school is September 8th. So we have a little bit of time left mm -hmm. and to improve the, these uh, metrics and the impact in the district. And we're hoping that that's what happens is the cases go down because that improves our, our data. I think part of the concern for parents is what if data gets worse mm -hmm. and then we can't have K3? Like, when do we make that determination? So that's August 15th. We wanted to set a date that for parents to know, because obviously there's child, there's a lot of arranging and planning. So August 15th, as, as it sits today, Kirk County is at 28.7 cases per 100,000. So we'll be watching that because it's right close to that 30 cases, which is the cutoff. So as long as we stay under 30 cases per 100,000 on our weekly metrics, on August 15th, we'll say green light, we are moving ahead. If we dip above, or if we go above that 30 cases per 100,000 in between now and then, we would have to announce we don't meet the criteria that the state is giving to allow us to open. So we will make that firm announcement on August 15th because that gives parents three weeks to make arrangements for that September 8th start date, whether that's we're permitted to have students in the building or not permitted to have students in the building. Uh, tutoring for parents trying to help with our kids. Last year proved that I wasn't smarter than the six. <laughs> <laughs> Me either. Uh, Yes, that's actually one thing where we've begun to explore um, as part of our homeschool program, but we'd offer that for all K-12 families, is uh, equipping parents, providing seminars and professional development for just some great tips and strategies to help parents navigate uh, learning at home. So we'll make sure that we have information out there. So that's, that's kind of on our radar and one of our, our things to do that we plan to do. And I think that the other... Um... The other thing to consider right now is as teachers are delivering that distance learning for grades four through 12, they, the schools aren't closed as uh, tightly as what we saw in the first uh, period of COVID impact. And there may be opportunities to actually interact with that teacher. We have to keep our staff safe, um, but there may be a, a way to set up something. So if a teacher comes in, we have a barrier, or I'm sorry, a parent comes in, we have some kind of a barrier where actually teachers, or I'm sorry, parents could confer with teachers. And um, those are all things we have to work out. We've, we've just had this information for <laughs> four, three or four days. So we are, um, we still need to talk to teachers and see what makes them feel safe because we have heard from our teachers that there are things that they need as well. And so we're being responsive in the whole system uh, because we're all together in this and we're all pulling the same direction and that is uh, kids going back to school, but it's not gonna do us a lot of good if we have sick teachers. So we're trying to make sure that um, we have everything covered and, and build a system that works for everybody. Uh, Mrs. Stringer asks, will students receive grades this year at all le levels? If students and families struggle to participate, what will the plan be? Yeah, that's a really good question. So we are still waiting on official guidance. Um, we know that last year uh, the state was very prescriptive in what we could do for grades. Um, I believe that's under development. And in the next six weeks, five weeks before school starts, we expect to have a clear answer uh, for that from the state of Oregon. So... We believe that for the, the homeschool support program, we have, we're developing a report card and those students will have grades. 
the parent is involved in that and they are the, the main teacher and we give the support. So yes, there will be grades. If students are on site, kindergarten through third grade, yes, they'll have grades. There will be assessments. And we believe that it's possible with the new model to actually do grades for the four through 12 as well, because it's so much more detailed and defined than it was last year when we had to just move from full speed into the school year where we were monitoring student attendance to everybody's out. And you know, teachers had to do all this on the fly. They had to learn a complete new way of teaching. And so you know, people were trying to respond. We've had some time. Um, some of our teachers are experts and we're gonna use them to help support other teachers. And we know that part of what we have in front of us is finding out what our teachers need and then offering uh, professional development and offering supports um, so that they can better support kids. That's really what we're looking at is um, if things have changed and we're gonna be in this state for a while, then we need to find out how to make it really good. And that's what we're committed to is a really good education for kids. And we think that some great things are happening. I know I see on the feed that some um, parents are considering, um, what's the um, Oregon, uh, Oregon Virtual Academy? Yeah. And so we, we've looked at Oregon Virtual Academy. We know what it has in it. Um, we don't think that it is up to um, what we want for our students. We offer, you know, of course that's an option for anybody, yeah. but um, Johnny looks at this and, you know, in Crook County, we're a bit competitive. So we not only um, want to meet uh, what other people are doing, but we really want Crook County to be a place where you get something better. And that's well, part of who we are and we're gonna continue to push that way. But parents have options now and we know that and we support you and, and we, are, we, are, we offer you uh, the best we can give. And if you find better then of course, that's what we want you to have for your family. Yeah, and, and I'm just thinking in that same vein, one way we know we're going to be better with these larger virtual schools, um, the class size, the, the ratio is about one to, I think, about 50, where we're ensuring on that regular instruction model that class sizes are what they would be when students return. So it'd be one to about 22 with that live interaction. So it definitely, we're, we're wanting to offer a better product for our families, uh, just because that's who we are and that's what we want to do. And we want to keep students learning through this. So Amy's asking if they if parents have a chance to look at the curriculum and to uh, yes you do have a chance to look at the curriculum the curriculum that our teachers will continue to use is the curriculum that you're familiar with that we have offered those curriculums that we use they have always been uh, teacher centered but as we see that this model takes more um, support in the home we have looked at the great resources that that curriculum offers. There's all kinds of support uh, books, workbooks, take-home materials, and we are looking at purchasing those. Our principals are coming through those to see if they're really a good product and if they get kids where they need to go, and if that's the case, then we'll purchase those. Um, and the homeschool, Johnny has picked out a whole menu of things, so it's almost like like Dr. Hoff used to say to um, build your own burrito, you can look in there and see what it is that meets your wishes and your desires. And um, the regular school, we will use our regular curriculum with additional supports and resources for it. And if people want to see it, yes, totally. We will make a way for you to see it. I've got two questions coming okay. in from the Zoom participants. Uh, Mr. White, who I believe is the music teacher at Barnes View, if I'm thinking of the right Philip White. I was asking about what about ventilation in the buildings? And I remember yeah. our uh, facilities director, Leland, had some good news on that. Okay, I'm gonna let you go with that. I know that in, in I just know of a lot of money that we're spending to increase <laughs> ventilation. So yeah. I'll let you speak to the details. Yeah, so I know uh, Le uh, Leland Bliss, our facilities director, when this all started in March and we had to, to shut down completely, um, he was actually, uh, looked at the ventilation systems and we're able in our schools to, and I don't know all the technical words for this, but flush the air, get new air in. I believe it was every 15 minutes in the majority of our buildings, which he said it actually would be some of the most ventilated fresh air uh, that you would be able to find in any, you know, any home or building. So in terms of building ventilation, I believe we're actually in really good shape. 
The next question, and uh, Dr. Johnson, you kind of mentioned this, will the grading be pass-fail again until the kids are back in school? I, at this time, the guidance says we're giving grades. Yeah. So I don't control the guidance and um, we will just have to continue to see what we can do um, to support what families want. But right now it looks like they are regular grades with regular percentages and regular assessments. I have one side bonus note to share. You do? Okay. So we asked our families in our initial survey about a month ago, um, how many had adequate internet access and about 9% of our families reported that they did not. Um, and I know that we put out Wi-Fi buses uh, last March to help those families, but we wanna go even one step beyond. And we plan to have mobile hotspots. We're exploring different options so that we know that all families have access to um, online capabilities. So we were looking at that and more details will come. So there's don't 20, the $28 million coming out um, from, yeah. is it million? Yeah, 28 million coming out from the state and it's a grant. So we are applying for, it's not gonna be a $28 million grant, but we're gonna apply for money to support the hotspots and we're trying to get those for everybody that needs them. So here's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, if we are the only district in central Oregon able to offer in-person K through three instruction, will out of district transfers be allowed? Uh, good question, really good question. So we have capacity issue. We have capacity limitations where um, there's a 35 square foot build classroom capacity per kit. So we would have to really look at how many spots we reason uh, logistically could offer uh, students see. that are outside the outside of Kirk County. We need to make sure that we have enough spots for Kirk County students before we could allow an out of district transfer to take one of those spots. So I just want to give kudos to our school board. Uh, last year, they looked at the, the space needs in the district. And as you know, we're opening STEAM's pillar this fall. And if we didn't have STEAM's pillar, we would have a space issue. But I will tell you that at this point, we have open classrooms in Barnes Butte and Crooked River. And so our capacity is greater than it was this year. We will continue to develop capacity in the district because uh, if we have people move here, then they need to go to school here. You can't send people away. Um, transfer has a process and they apply to be, have a, get a transfer into the district. So all of that is carefully monitored as, as we are looking at our capacity and our teacher load. And we know we have to keep 35 square feet per student and we will maintain that. And um, otherwise, we that's not a huge concern of ours right now, thanks to what the board did last year with, with um, our old Pioneer Complex. And I know if you drive by there, you'll see a lot of exciting things going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are able to open that on time uh, in September with our littles will be, if, if all things stick, our littles will be starting in uh, September 8th at Steen's Pillar. With, with that in mind, though, we do anticipate, and we've actually already had a few families from uh, regional districts already transfer to our homeschool partner program with Johnny because that is a special offering. So we do anticipate uh, a, a lot of families coming over for that. When you're doing homeschool, if you have this uh, highly skilled teacher that's available to help support you as you teach your students, that's a great thing. And I, I and having him right here and experienced with homeschool and understanding homeschool has been appealing to people. So we think that's an option that our, our community wanted and we're excited to start it. Uh, so questions about, concerns about a yo-yo situation yep. where you go mm -hmm. in, you come out, um, and then if that's the case, what happens when students start online, you're in the classroom, you're back at home, like how does that work? that regular instruction model. That's what we're saying, where people choose that. So that's why we're looking at, uh, like we talked about, and you'll see this in the parent level we, letter, we have dates where we're gonna look at trends. So if we're right on the line, you know, every other week, we probably will look to not create a yo-yo situation. Um, so we will be looking at the trends every month 
and making those decisions so that we have a little safe safe place. Uh, I think it's realistic to say you could get a surge and that you would have to move um, students out of the school. I mean, I don't anticipate that in Crook County. We haven't had a surge like that. Uh, nonetheless, we want to be sensitive to um, the wellness of the community. And if you've got a surge, um, I think that would be a requirement that students would be out. Now, with that said, we are supporting teachers as they plan and asking that all of our teachers learn how to use Google Classroom because it, it will build into the system some um, easier transitions for everyone. And so again, that's like I said, we've been at this stage for three or four days, so we don't want to overpromise and under deliver. I'm sorry, we do want to overpromise and no. What do I want to do? I want to we want under promise and, and over deliver. deliver. Yeah, but you get it. We uh, we don't yeah. want to promise you things yeah. we can't deliver on. Yeah. So um, I just want to be careful with that. But I also want you to know um, we're thinking about everything that we can think of. And then we ask other people, what are you thinking of? And we add that. So we have a long list of things that we are considering and working on. Um, some of them from parents, some from teachers, some from students. And we're doing everything we can to try to build the best system possible. Okay, uh, this parent, uh, Sarah Teske, I know the Teskes have coached their son Lucas awesome. in basketball. So they're a Hawaiian family. Yes. Uh, but they also, they're always come to school here. But her question is, how many anticipated times per week will students have FaceTime with teachers for the online option? I'm so glad. Oh, good. Right on. I am so glad that was, because that's a huge feedback from parents where uh, when we quickly transitioned to learning at home last year, last spring, uh, we set it up differently and we've learned and we're, we're always looking to get better. So we are planning to offer for each class, so students have four classes a day at six through 12 level, a daily, every, every class will have a daily direct instruction, video instruction, it might be virtual, it might be recorded, but we expect every day teachers will reach out to their class to provide a brand new lesson. So we have an instructional assistant asking if instructional assistants will get training in Google Classroom. And I'm gonna commit, yes, we'll make that available to Good question. Yeah, thanks, Christy. Let's see here. Uh, how will our IEP students designed instructions? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what Dr. Johnson mentioned earlier. Um, so each student on an IEP, their case manager, who's uh, will will work with the parents and collaboratively come up with a system that works for those parent those families to make sure that they get the services uh, that are in their IEPs. So, um, Christine, I hear you asking about the 3-4 blend, and I checked on that today with the state, and we are only cleared to bring up through third grade in. So we'll have to offer, offer that fourth grade education via distance learning, and as soon as possible, we'll bring those fourth graders in. Uh, will transportation be provided for students on IEPs for that small group instruction? We are going to refer that question to uh, Mona Reback. We have many um, vehicles that run special transportation for students on IEPs. So we're just going to look at the need and make sure that we met. And I'm going to refer that on to someone who is actually more skilled in that area than I am. So give me your name. I mean, email in with your name and we'll make sure that that gets addressed. If someone can call you. Uh, will K through three have a full school day? Yes, they will. Currently, yeah. If, if the metro starts today. Mm -hmm. So the, the flowers will be much like those you were familiar with last year. So I have a question, what would a school day look like in the homeschool model, model versus the online kind of regular instruction model? And that's a really good question. So the regular instruction model. Can I, can I ask, can you I get say, it. can we bring Johnny back in? Yep. And I'm going to give Johnny a task. A shield. So that Johnny can be in Johnny, the discussion. There's a shield on my office on the. Johnny's going to squeeze in here. Uh, 
I know you didn't think these arms could lift that chair, but look at that. All right, and, and I can answer this question, and Johnny, feel free to fit in. So, yeah. what does it look like in the regular, uh, on regular instruction when it's virtual compared to what it looks like with homeschool? So, if you choose the regular instruction model when schools are closed, your your student is assigned a teacher, and that teacher does a, a daily lesson multiple times, check-ins throughout the day. So, that teacher is providing your student daily instruction. On the homeschool option, that means you have met with Johnny, chosen your curriculum as a family, and you are using uh, the online, or sorry, the homeschool coordinator as a resource with weekly tutoring, but, but the parent is essentially homeschooling and is serving as the learning mentor or teacher for that student. So um, Michelle, or I'm sorry, uh, Kaylee? Asking, Kylie. Kylie is asking, if um, K through three can do, I'm sorry, Michelle is asking if K through three can do homeschooling. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, just to clarify uh, a little bit about homeschooling and why we're using the phrase homeschooling versus you know distance learning. So when you hear the word homeschool, it, it probably brings up a memory of traditional homeschooling, which is, is more what the homeschool partner program is about. Uh, it's, it's really a parent directed, education that's personalized to a student. Um, and, and so we, we provide funding and resources for the parent to really guide a personalized education for their child. Whereas distance learning or online learning is, is usually based more on uh, what's called a learning management system, uh, traditional distance learning, like, like our uh, online option at the high school. And so that's, that's based more on a, a learning management system where all of the students' classes are organized and a student works through on a computer um, completing tasks until they finish a course. So homeschooling is a much more diverse um, opportunity for kids. It could be much more hands-on, much more real world, whereas online learning is more of a, a taking a bunch of online classes to get through credits that are required. Um, just I think it's good to know the difference between what we mean by homeschool versus distance learning in that situation. And, and, the, and I think the, the key difference is the parent's role is yeah. a, a great, for parents who want to have greater control, um, more autonomy on their students' teaching, that's the homeschool. There's the, the parent has an active role in that. For the distance learning for our um, teachers, then our, our teachers are running daily lessons. So it just mm -hmm. depends on what works for your family and your desires as a family and the role that you'll have in their education. That's good. Yeah, and just, just clarify one more thing. On the, uh, the chart, or the diagram you just showed, we have, a, we have the online option, mm -hmm. and then we have some middle school distance learning option. What do we call that? The regular instruction where kids are regularly enrolled right. with their teacher right. when schools are closed would be a virtual option with their right. teacher running it. But we, we also have at the middle school level, we have like a fuel ed courses yeah. that are self-paced. So, yeah, so when, I, when I'm talking about distance learning traditionally or, or online learning traditionally, it's, it's, a, it's a learning management system where kids are learning through software versus what we're doing with our school teachers this year is, is gonna be a much more robust uh, experience for kids. Um, if, you, if you feel qualified to be heavily involved in your child's education, then homeschooling is a good option. If you feel like you really need a professional there with them every day, then traditional enrollment That's from good. home is what yeah. is what you want good to enroll. Clarification. Yeah. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. All right, Jason, how are we doing? Uh, Johnny, you can stay if you want. Oh, we're okay. doing all right. Um, I just Here's responded right. to a parent, but there is this question about explain why it's safe or allowable Ooh. for K through three to be in class and not the other students. I can. I can take that or do you want to explain? I don't know if we're talking outside of our field there and yeah. there's there's much discussion about it and um, I mean you can I think it's fair for you to say what you've read yeah we can but say we what don't want to set said. ourselves up as yeah. the specialists <laughs> part of what we do is where's my where's my guidance we get this 70 page guidance document and we're required to write like a 20 something page guidance uh, proposal. And so 
um, the because we're a public school and we accept public funding, those things become um, guidelines for us. I don't know. Where. Anyway, just so you know, you can look at the guidance too. It's online. It's public. And um, so, yeah. So the Oregon Department of Education, who, who releases the guidance Dr. Johnson's there. talking about, um, they, they are they are telling schools that based on studies that global studies that students, children ten and under, that studies have found that they are less likely to uh, contract the virus, less likely to spread the virus, and less likely to get as sick with the virus. So that's why the ODE has told schools that K three, because third grade is ten and under, K three has. Uh, more flexibility in their ability to return to schools. So Jenny, I just read your question. And the question is, if a family chooses distance learning, how much flexibility do they have for working um, with their students academics around the family schedule and needs versus homeschooling? Um, so the way that the day in the distance learning is set up now is that reading, language arts and mathematics will be taught in the morning. And so those are going to be important and foundational. And the teacher will do virtual instruction. So the teacher may sit down at the computer or set up the computer and they're teaching their whole language arts lesson. And the student has resources at home and the student gives or the teacher gives an assignment. And then the teacher will bring out the math and, and virtual. You're seeing the teacher. You're going to see the other children who are zooming in or using the technology to um, join together. And then in the afternoon, there's more um, less teacher directed time. And so there'll be some things like science and social studies and continued practice and uh, development of things through the resources that the teacher's providing for the afternoon. So I think it's pretty clear that the morning is probably the part where you're going to see the most direct instruction from that teacher. When it comes to homeschool, homeschoolers generally set up a routine um, and they set that routine around their family needs. My mother actually homeschooled my three younger brothers and after we had breakfast, even if people were dilly-dallying, she cleared everything and she brought out the homeschooling. And they did that from probably seven in the morning until noon. And then she would clean it up and off it went. So that was my mom's schedule. I don't know what Johnny's family schedule is, but generally they set a routine because our brains as humans, we like routine and we do well with routine. So that's just a couple examples, and I probably don't want to over talk it because Johnny's going to be a real expert on it. Um, and um, but we welcome your questions, and we'll try to help help you work through any questions. Well, we'll see a when next Wednesday. A Wednesday update. So if you're um, thinking about athletics, choir, band, um, the OSA, which is the state body that governs that, has uh, they will come out with an uh, update on the situation. Next Wednesday, so we'll keep you posted. Okay, um, I think we've got most questions covered. Um, I did provide the Ask CCSD email Good. on that, so if you want to just remind them. I do, um, because Jason Carr, who just does a fabulous job at getting the communication in to the right people and making sure there's lots of communication going out. He monitors anything that comes in all the time and he brings things to us and he gets answers and gets those back to you. It's a very fast service. And so we, uh, Jason, I'm gonna ask you to say the email because I just don't have it in the front of my head. It's ask, the word ask. Dr. Hoff does, go Dr. CCSD Hoff. at crookcounty.k12.or.us. And I think that- And it's on our um, website. Yeah, and it's on our website. So. And all I'll right. put it in Facebook page. And in the Facebook page. Yep. No more questions? All right. 
Well, you guys have an awesome weekend. Hang in there. So glad it cooled off a few degrees. Um, that was almost to the boiling point. So glad it's come down a few degrees and we look forward to seeing you soon. And we're going to keep working on things. Uh, we will remain optimistic and positive and flexible. Um, flexible. Everybody, please um, do what you can to slow the virus. And uh, we look forward to seeing you back soon. Take care. Take care.